Well, Judge Ken Starr has had a very distinguished career as a judge, attorney, solicitor general of the United States, independent counsel, lecturer, college president of a major college and university, commentator, best-selling author. I mean, he's pretty well done it all. He's got a brand new book of special interest to me and I think to all of us. It's called Religious Liberty in Crisis, Exercising Your Faith in an Age of Uncertainty. What an honor to welcome Judge Ken Starr. Ken, good to have you here. Thank, Thank you, you, Governor. Thank you. I cannot think of a book that is more timely, uh, even in light of some recent Supreme Court decisions, as your book on religious liberty. Why would you take on this topic? I mean, you could write about so many different things in the law. Obviously, this must be important to you. It's dear to my heart. And also, Governor, because of the pandemic, uh, your opening was very powerful. And mm. so how do we respond? Well, some governors, unlike the governor of Arkansas a few years ago, responded very poorly. Mm. To classify churches as non-essential and liquor stores as essential was just, to me, a step way too far that we had lost sight of what the founding generation wanted this country to be, which was a sweet land of liberty, including religious liberty. I had to write the book. Well, I think we're all glad you did because a lot of Americans just sort of obeyed whatever the government told them, even if it meant when the government said you can't go to church, or if you go, uh, only 10 of you can be in a building that seats 2,500. I mean, those kind of things, they're hard to even comprehend why any government official thinks that that makes sense. Um, so in the midst of the pandemic, you had some very heavy handed government mandates. Why did churches fall in line without fighting back better? I think the idea was let's be obedient. We also don't know uh, to authority. We're to yeah. respect authority. Uh, and we didn't know the ramifications of the benefit, but we should have caught on when, for example, the governor of Nevada said, casinos can operate at one half capacity, but churches 50, no matter how large the sanctuary, the auditorium. And so people should have said, and the pastors and the ministers, the priests, the rabbis started saying, this is not right. And so the litigation followed. It's a shame that we had to do this, but we had to live through approximately 10 months of heavy litigation until the Supreme Court, in time for Christmas, Merry Christmas, <laughs> in time for Hanukkah yeah. said, stop it, it's yeah. enough. We've got to allow these religious institutions to operate. As the Solicitor General of the United States, a lot of people may not know, you are the chief lawyer for the executive branch of government, so you have argued cases before the Supreme Court on many occasions. You know them well. Were you surprised that the current Supreme Court actually came out in favor of some religious liberty cases recently? Not at all. And that's part of the good news, Governor, of the book. For 40 years, and I really became invested in the subject. I was interested in the subject. But 40 years ago during the Reagan administration, President Reagan, as you know, was a great friend of religious liberty. Yes. And at that time, so was Congress. Yeah, good point. And yeah. including Democrats. Yeah. It was pro-religious, yes, pro-religious legislation would pass. So for 40 years I've been watching this, but there's been a terrible erosion in the ability of people of faith to operate without a fear of government sanction. The church has really just brought it home. It's almost a parable of this broader truth that the culture has become hostile to, the popular culture has become hostile to religious liberty. But guess what? Throughout, through thick and thin, for 40 years, the Supreme Court of the United States has almost always ruled in favor of religious liberty, including just very recently in the city of Philadelphia case. And I hope everyone focuses on that because the Supreme Court was unanimous in rejecting the proposition that Catholic social services could be put out of business because they would not place precious children in non-traditional homes. You know, I, I was stunned that it was nine to zero. We don't typically see nine to zero cases, even on less controversial things. Is, is that a change of the attitude of the court? Or is it just that maybe there's enough presence there and a, a good sense of, of arguing the, the positive side of religious liberty that even the liberal side of the court is saying, you know, we can't really defy that? 
It's because of the great principles of religious liberty mm. that unite justices who might disagree on a wide, and do disagree on a wide range of things. An example I use in the book is a Christian school that fired a school teacher because she threatened litigation. Huh. That was viewed as totally incompatible with Paul's admonition of the church at Corinth. So you have to leave. And the Obama administration, EEOC, and the Obama administration Justice Department took the side of the teacher. She lost nine to nothing in the Supreme Court with Ruth Bader Ginsburg voting in favor of religious liberty, the right of the Christian school to determine who will teach. That is a very powerful reminder. In the book, Religious Liberty in Crisis, that you've written, you also establish why of all the basic rights we have in the Bill of Rights, and we have quite a few, and they're, they're given to individuals, not given to the government, they're given to us as citizens. Why is this one so important? And you talk about that, and I want you to articulate that for our audience. Because first of all, look at the text. It's the first of the first. If we don't have religious liberty, the other liberties are going to be seriously called into question. They're going to be eroded. But it also has to do with the founding generation's view of what the good society is. And in the very first Congress of the United States, the following law was passed to govern what is now Ohio and Indiana, the Midwest. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Religion was viewed as one of the three pillars of the good society, the moral society. And th thus we need, as the founders would say, to preserve the opportunity, protect freedom of conscience. You're free not to believe, Sure. right? Attend the church of your choice, but you also don't have to attend. It's part of the beauty of the American system. It believes in freedom. Freedom is the baseline, but we have a society that, as William O. Douglas said, a liberal justice of the Supreme Court, we are a religious people whose institutions presuppose a supreme being. That's who we are. Mm. I hope we don't forget who we are. I sometimes fear that we do. Uh, it's why your book is a very, very important message for every American, not just church-going people. This is an important message. I would love for young people to get this book. I, I wish they would get it with the hope that they could tear it apart. I mean, just, just say to them, read the book and see if you can find all the faults in it and see if it doesn't speak to you because you've documented it in such a very powerful way. Ken Starr, great to see you again. So good to see you, Governor. Thank you for being here, and thank you for the book. It's called Religious Liberty in Crisis, Exercising Your Faith in an Age of Uncertainty by Ken Starr. It is available now. And by the way, everyone who's concerned about the erosion of our rights, you honestly need to read it. You truly do.